The uh, title of this uh, presentation is Two Arguments in Favor of Non-Human Animal Rights. So these are going to be philosophical arguments uh, that I think anybody can follow, and uh, they're relatively simple arguments, but if they're sound, they have profound practical consequences about you know the way we comport ourselves in the world. They have implications for what we eat, what we wear, how we experiment on things, and so on and so forth. So, um, so these are philosophical arguments. Later on in the question and answer period, if people want to talk about the theology of this, you know, I have an interpretation of the Bible. You know, a lot of people who are not animal rightists. Um, base their opposition to the animal rights position on supposed biblical evidence. You know, God gave us permission to kill animals and so on. I think it's much more complicated than that. But, but these are going to be philosophical arguments that should be accessible to and of interest to anybody, you know, no matter what your uh, beliefs happen to be. So I wonder if I, I could start with three terms uh, just to get us going here, uh, two of which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And then the third one uh, you may or may not be familiar with, uh, racism, sexism, and speciesism. And these terms are listed there on the handout. Uh, let's uh, just start out uh, with a preliminary definition of racism as um, unfair treatment of a being solely or primarily due to that being's race. So the strong version of racism would be unfair treatment of a being solely because that being is a member of a race different from your own. A weaker version of racism would be unfair treatment of a being primarily because of that being's race, but there may be other factors involved as well. So I would take it that a uh, preliminary uh, example of racism that we would all see as uh, an example of racism would be slavery on the basis of race. Okay, that's one Americans are familiar with. So. Uh, uh, it seems arbitrary that you would uh, make some people amenable to being enslaved because they're black and not other people because they're white. Um, so it's the arbitrariness of it that is, seems especially bothersome. Uh, the term sexism is uh, modeled after the term racism. So on this preliminary definition, we could define sexism as unfairly treating a being primarily, or say in the strong version of sexism, unfairly treating a being solely because that being is uh, a member of a sex different from your own. And then the weaker version of sexism would be unfairly treating a being primarily because of that being sex, although there may be other things involved as well. And I assume that a preliminary example of sexism that we would all agree is an example of sexism would be distributing the right to vote on the basis of sex, right? So it seems arbitrary to give some people the right to vote because they're male and then not giving other people the right to vote or say own property because they're female. <coughs> Now, I'd like to move to a third term, which is modeled after both racism and sexism, and it's called speciesism. You may or may not be familiar with this term, um, but you can see where this is going, right? <laughs> speciesism is alleged to be a moral evil uh, that is analogous to racism and sexism. It, it consists in its strong version of unfair treatment of a being solely because that being is a member of a species different from your own species. Okay, and then the weaker version of speciesism would be unfair treatment of a being primarily because of that being species, although there may be other factors involved. Now, I don't know that I can start out with an uncontroversial example of speciesism, because that's what we're here to examine tonight, right? This is uh, what's, it's contested territory in the culture that we live in as to whether or not speciesism is uh, even remotely analogous to racism and sexism. And I'm going to suggest that it is for various reasons. Um, so let me propose a possible example of speciesism just to get us started, and then I'd like to offer two arguments uh, in favor of the claim that non-human animals have rights and that speciesism is a, a moral evil strongly analogous to racism and sexism. So the preliminary example I'd like to start with goes something like this. Imagine that you're at opening night of the opera in any cold weather city, and what happens in opening night of the opera is people show up with fur coats. And if it's New York or Berlin, and I mean, these are both males and females who show up with fur coats, okay, of opening night of the opera. So imagine a confrontation between an animal rights protester on the one hand and somebody wearing a fur coat. So the way that conversation would go is probably something like this. The animal rights protester would go up to the person wearing the fur coat and ask, why are you wearing a fur coat? Okay, and then the response probably would be, because it's cold outside. Okay, which seems fair enough. Human beings have a right to, you know, warm themselves against the elements. Uh, but then the animal rights protester might ask, well, why, in order to keep warm, would you be willing to have several dozen mink killed when you could keep warm with a cloth coat? Okay, uh, it seems unnecessary that you'd be willing to have all these beings killed when you could keep warm with a cloth coat. 
Now the response on the part of the animal rights, uh, of, the, of the person wearing the fur coat would be, well, they're just animals, right? They're just animals. Now that's enough to solve the issue for a lot of people, just by designating them as animals indicates that they're not worthy of moral respect. Now the animal rights protester at that point would probably ask, but what exactly is it about non-human animals that makes them amenable to treatment like this, you know, being killed for human purposes, whereas we would not think that it would be moral to do that with respect to human beings, okay? Now at that point, it's a very good question, right? At, th at that point, I think the person wearing the mink coat would probably say something like this. This is the standard sort of response to that question. It's because we are rational and they are not. Um, I mean, that's, that's the standard way that people in Western Civ for thousands of years since Aristotle have differentiated themselves from non-human animals and give, and, and the alleged um, privileges that we have are a result of the fact that we possess rationality and the non-human animals do not, okay? Uh, I think that's a believable conversation, the way it would go back and forth like that. Now, when I hear a conversation like that, <clears throat> all sorts of questions pop up in my head. Um, one of the things I start wondering about is, where this leaves um, human beings with mental disabilities. Um, if you have to possess rationality in order to deserve moral respect, does that mean, I hope you can put your seatbelts on on this one, does that mean it would be okay to eat idiot burgers or we could experiment painfully or lethally on mentally challenged human beings <clears throat> um, because they lack rationality? My hope is that you're uncomfortable with those possibilities, right? In other words, uh, it makes one wonder whether or not possession of rationality does all of the work that a lot of people think it does in moral theory. Um, uh, do we really want to have the criterion set that high that you have to be rational in order to deserve moral respect? I wonder what that does to me in dreamless sleep. Uh, I'm only intermittently rational, okay? Uh, 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 there's all sorts of things I think that are problematic about that sort of justification. Well, I wonder if I could jump into two arguments. Uh, one is called the argument from sentiency, and the other is called the argument from marginal cases. So the argument from sentiency has, it's a real simple argument, it's got two premises, and from the two premises, I try to derive a conclusion, okay? And the first premise is a philosophical premise that goes something like this. Um, any being that can experience pain or suffer now, it's gonna take me a while to get through this argument. So I'm gonna use those terms experience pain and suffer as roughly synonymous. Now maybe later on you wanna make a distinction between physical pain on the one hand and then subtle psychological suffering on the other. Uh, we can talk about that later. But, um, but so I'm gonna use those terms as meaning roughly the same thing. Any being that can experience pain or suffer has at the very least the right. Now what I mean by a right is a legitimate claim to something, okay? Uh, so so th 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 this is an argument, it's not an argument from charity saying like it's, it's okay if you're nice to animals if you want to be nice to animals, but you don't have to be. I'm saying you have to be. I mean, th th animals have rights. So any being that can experience pain or suffer has at the very least the right not to be forced to experience pain or suffer or be killed unnecessarily or gratuitously. So... That, that word unnecessarily is a big word, by the way. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you're being asked to think about here is under what conditions is it necessary that you inflict, by the way, I don't mention non-human animals in that first premise. I'm just asking you to think about any being that can experience pain or suffer. And I'm suggesting that basically you ought not to inflict unnecessary suffering or pain or death on a being like that unnecessarily. So in a way you're being asked to think about the conditions under which it is necessary that you inflict suffering. And in some cases it is. For example, um, <clears throat> suppose, um, suppose you, uh, you had a separated shoulder and you went to an orthopedic surgeon. I don't know if you've ever seen this happen. Uh, I used to be an orderly in a hospital where the, the therapy is the orthopedic surgeon gives the patient a localized anesthesia, which doesn't help much. And then basically what the orthopedic surgeon does is just basically ram the shoulder back into the socket as the person screams in pain. Okay, I take it that no one would want to go up to the, the doctor and ask him if he was a sadist or something, like, you know, do you get your jollies out of doing this, you know? Uh, no, I think the doctor would say, what? No, there was a necessity in doing this, right? 
In other words, I had to do this for this patient because if you didn't, the person would be much worse off, you know, with a shoulder dangling outside of the socket for the rest of that person's life, okay? So, so there are conditions under which it is necessary to inflict suffering on beings. But when you do that, presumably it's for the benefit of the being who is having the suffering inflicted on him or on her, okay? Um, so, so all that's being claimed in the first premise is that you ought not to inflict suffering or pain or death on a being who is sentient, you know, is capable of experiencing pleasure and pain unnecessarily or gratuitously, okay? So I'm asking you to think about that first premise to the argument to see if you find it acceptable. Is there some problem with that first premise? Um, um, like what would the world be like if the first premise were false? You know, what would the world be like if you could inflict suffering on a being and there was no necessity in doing so? You could just gratuitously inflict suffering on a being who was capable of experiencing suffering. I'm alleging that, now, now if you know that this is a first premise in an argument for animal rights, you might just object on principle <laughs> to, to what's going on here. But if you just look at the first premise all by itself, uh, I think it's an acceptable premise. I think we all accept that premise. I could be wrong about that. Um, now there just seems to be something really basic to morality to assume that it's not okay to inflict suffering on a being unless there's some necessity to doing so. Okay, that if you inflict suffering on a being gratuitously, that there's something morally problematic about that. So, so that's the first premise. It's a philosophical premise we can talk about. By the way, I have real thick skin when it comes time for the question and answer period. I'm open to any criticisms that you have on, uh, uh, regarding this stuff. So I know this is all contested territory. Um, now the second premise is not a philosophical premise. The second premise to the argument from sentiency is an empirical premise. It's, it, it's some sort of quasi-scientific claim. So uh, the, the first premise is one that can be debated philosophically, right? The second premise is really a matter for people in the sciences to either you know, confirm or deny. So we're not going to establish the truth or falsity of the second premise here. Uh, but I would like to say a few things about it, okay? So the second premise is what? It is not necessary that we inflict pain or suffering or death on sentient animals in order for us to have a healthy diet, okay? So the claim here in the second premise is that you could have a healthy life on a vegetarian basis, okay? It's not necessary to inflict suffering and death on animals in order to have a healthy diet. Um, now, it might be the case that somebody wants to say that that claim is false, okay? Somebody might want to say that you have to eat animals, right, in order to have a healthy diet. If you went that route, you would have to account for the hundreds of millions of healthy vegetarians in India alone, <laughs> which is a poor country. In other words, I, I have no trouble if somebody wants to reject the second premise, but I, I would ask them to account for all the counterexamples, right? How do you account for the fact that, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world are vegetarian and healthy? Um, uh, now, in the second premise, I'm, I'm not trying to advance the, something could, you could call the victory through vegetables hypothesis that suggests what? You'd have a healthier life on a vegetarian basis than you would on a meat-eating basis. Actually, there are a lot of people that want to defend that view, right? You know, that a lot of studies that suggest on a vegetarian diet, the rates of heart disease and different types of cancer are lower than on a diet where you eat meat. So I'm not going that far. I'm not trying to say you would have a healthier life on a vegetarian basis than on a meat-eating basis. I'm just trying to say that you could have a healthy life. You'd have to eat intelligently, like if all you ate were um, candy bars and hostess ho-hos, and you know, <laughs> if that's all you ate, you'd probably be a sick puppy pretty quickly. Um, but then again, if you ate unintelligently on a meat-eating basis, you would be pretty sick in a hurry as well, right? Um, uh, so you have to eat intelligently, right? I think no matter which way you go but you could have a healthy life on a vegetarian basis. So, so here's the way the argument goes. What I'm claiming is that there's a connection between the first and the second premises of this argument. So this is roughly analogous to a math argument. It's not as rigorous as a math argument, but it's something like that. In other words, if you accept the evidence and the premises, I'm claiming that the conclusion follows, right? And we should, you know, put some weight uh, in, in stock in the conclusion. 
So the, the, the words, I think, that link the two premises together are unnecessarily in the first premise and then not necessary in the second premise. So I'm not asking you yet whether you accept this argument. You may want to trash it later on. But I'm asking, does everybody see the connection between the two premises there? So the first premise is saying what? You ought not to inflict suffering or death on a being who's capable of experiencing suffering, right? Unnecessarily. I'm saying that's a general principle in morality. I'm alleging that we all accept already. So, so I'm not saying that I'm introducing anything new to you in the first premise. Um, I think the first premise is something you would already accept anyhow. We'll see if that's right, but that's what I suspect. That's a general premise. And then in the second premise, I'm saying that an, an, an example of unnecessary infliction of suffering and death is slitting the carotid artery of cows at the slaughterhouse or pigs and so on and so forth. Um, if it's the case that we could have a healthy life on a vegetarian basis, then a prime example of unnecessary infliction of suffering and death is what we routinely do at slaughterhouses in, you know, in serving up food for the table. So if I'm right there that there's a connection between those two premises, it looks like the conclusion follows, and that's in the third step. Therefore, killing sentient animals for the table is cruel. Now, you may wonder where the word cruelty comes from in the conclusion, because I haven't used it in either of the two premises. Uh, but the word cruelty is shorthand for what? The infliction of unnecessary suffering, right? Um, so, so therefore, killing sentient animals for the table is cruel and ought to be avoided, okay? So what I'm, and, and, and I think this argument, it's, um, it's like these old suits that, you know, boys used to buy, you know, have bought for them on Easter in the old days where, I don't know if you remember these, where, you know, you buy a boy's suit and it would have a jacket and two pair of pants and a reversible vest. So you had about five or six options for the one suit. Anybody remember these things? So uh, <clears throat> this argument is like that. This is an argument that has to do with eating, but you could easily switch some of the premises around to have it apply to clothing that we wear, right? So the second premise would read, it is not necessary that we inflict pain or suffering or death on sentient animals in order for us to hold our pants up with leather belts in order to protect our feet with leather shoes, um, in order to stay warm with mink coats. Okay, so it has implications for clothing. It has educational implications. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you know, in, in the UK, you know, their whole medical school education is cruelty-free. You know, uh, they, they educate doctors, you know, who are pretty competent doctors, right? Uh, uh, without, you know, uh, any sort of cruelty in the education of their physicians. Um, so the second premise there would read, it's not necessary that we inflict pain or suffering or death on sentient animals in order for us to have medical professionals, right, who are competent, um, and so on. Uh, 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 it has implications for, um, I don't know, new eye makeup that comes on the market, you know, where you probably are aware of this, that, you know, very often eye uh, uh, makeup uh, involves what? Taking rabbits and dripping trying to figure out how many drops, you know, of an active chemical you drip into a rabbit's eye until it blisters over and the, uh, the rabbit becomes blind. Um, so, so you can have an argument here regarding cosmetics and a lot of household products. Actually, what I'm alleging here that this is a really simple argument, but if it goes through, in other words, if it's sound, it has all sorts of practical ramifications that are, you know, pretty far reaching. Most notably regarding what we eat but then a lot of other practices as well. So that's the, that's the argument from sentiency. We'll, we'll see what you make of that in a bit. Now I've got a second argument. Um, it's called the argument for marginal cases. <clears throat> um, and now the argument for marginal cases asks that you make a distinction between being a moral agent on the one hand and then being a moral patient on the other. So what it means to be a moral agent is to be a being who can act morally or immorally. So a moral agent is a being who can do things that are moral or immoral. Another way to put it would be to say a moral agent is a being who can be held accountable for his or her actions, okay? Now, if you ask the question, what property do you have to possess or what criterion do you have to meet in order to be a moral agent? It's kind of nice. Just about everybody agrees on what the property is you have to possess in order to be a moral agent, and that's you have to be rational, okay? Uh, now, there may be debates as to whether or not a particular being is sufficiently rational in order to be held accountable for his or her actions. 
Um, but everybody agrees that rationality is the property that you would have to possess in order to be a moral agent. So you may remember the character Lenny from Steinbeck's novel of Mice and Men, right? Or, you know, in some passages it looks like he's rational enough to be held accountable for his actions. And then in other passages, you know, it just looks like he's Captain Whack and Crackers. You know, he's nuts and, you know, he, he can't be held accountable for his actions. But still, even though there's a gray area like that, we, we, everybody agrees that rationality is the property that you would have to possess in order to be a moral agent. Um, there's some problems there. You know, uh, do we want to say that somebody who's drunk is a moral agent in the same way, that somebody who's sober, you know, if somebody does something bad under economic duress, you know, uh, <laughs> are they moral agents? Uh, uh, there are problems there, but I don't think it's with the rationality criteria. Um, now, let's ask a different question. What property do you have to possess in order to be a moral patient? And what it means to be a moral patient is not to be a being who acts morally or immorally, but a moral patient is a being who receives moral or immoral treatment from others. Okay, so a moral patient is a being who can be treated unfairly or cruelly. Uh, another way to put it would be to say a moral patient is a being who could have his or her rights violated. Okay, so a moral agent is a being who treats others morally or immorally, and a moral patient is a being who receives moral or immoral treatment from others. So this distinction makes sense to everybody. Um, now, uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't notice this distinction and just talk vaguely about moral beings, but they're really, it's quite different being a moral agent and a moral patient. I suspect a lot of people don't notice the differences because all of us in this room are both moral agents and moral patients, because we're both. We tend not to notice it. They're two quite different things. But I'd like to ask the question as to whether or not there might be some beings in the world who are moral patients but not moral agents. Right? Are there some beings in the world who could be treated cruelly but might not be sufficiently rational in order to be held accountable for their actions? Um, so if you ask the question, what property do you have to possess or what criterion do you have to meet in order to be a moral patient, the sparks fly. There's all kinds of debates about this. And it, all, it involves all sorts of issues. Not, not only the animal rights issue, but this involves the abortion debate, right? This involves the debate regarding euthanasia. You know, all sorts of debates hinge on what you're going to count as moral patience. So I wonder if we could try out three possibilities here to see what the implications would be of three different directions you could go in regarding moral patience status. Now, what some people want to say is that in order to be a moral patient, in other words, in order to receive respect from others, or in order to be a possessor of rights, you have to be rational. People, people say this a lot. In other words, it's like they think that what rationality does so well as a criterion for moral agency, why not have it do double duty and have it be the criterion for moral patience as well? So if in order to be a moral agent, if you have to be rational, why not say in order to be a moral patient, you have to be rational? Now, I have a question mark next to that <laughs> word rationality there and on, on the handout. And, and it's because I think that if, if we made rationality the criterion for moral patiency status, disastrous consequences would follow. Um, if we said in order to deserve moral respect, you first had to be rational, what that would mean is infants would not deserve moral respect, okay? Uh, mentally challenged people would not deserve moral respect. Uh, penal, people in the grip of senile dementia or advanced Alzheimer's would not deserve moral respect because they're not rational, okay? Uh, I, I just find those consequences just totally unacceptable. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a criterion that, although a lot of people mouth the words, um, in, in order to respect from, be, to deserve respect from others, you have to be willing to, f you know, fulfill your part of the bargain. You know, you have to be rational both, you know, both as a moral agent and as a moral patient. I don't know if anybody really believes that. I mean, the consequences are so severe, right? So, so what I'm suggesting is, if you have a really high criterion or a high hurdle, I'm using a track and field metaphor here. If the hurdle is this high, it's more like a high jump rather than a hurdle. <laughs> it's, it's such a high criterion that many people are not going to be able to clear it. Um, a, a minority of human beings, but still a sizable minority of human beings, if you include infants, the mentally challenged, people in senile dementia, and so on. 
So what I'm suggesting is what we ought to do is reject rationality as a criterion for moral patiency status. I, I don't think it's that hard to think this through. In other words, a lot of people assume that if rationality is what you need to be a moral agent, then that's what you need to be a moral patient too. But I think if you just make the distinction between the two, people can see that you don't want to use rationality as the property that you have to have in order to deserve respect from others. Now, if that's too high a criterion, it makes sense for people then to lower it significantly. So what some people do is claim that life should be the criterion for moral patiency status, right? That all life deserves respect. So Albert Schweitzer, right, is famous for, if you ever read his writings, for, you know, trying to think through what that would be like to, re to show moral respect for all living things. Uh, the, the Jain sect within Hinduism, you know, tries to, you know, play this out as well. Uh, some people claim to be pro-life and think that all life deserves respect. Now I'm going to try to advance the thesis that this is an equally disastrous move. <laughs> that there's no workable mora morality that can follow from a, the claim that all life deserves respect. If it's the case that life is the criterion for moral respect, for moral patiency status, then cutting out cancerous tumors would be immoral. Because actually you're cutting out not just life, but life that has human genetic material, right, and is identifiably human. Um, living cells are, you know, there and multi that's the problem with cancer cells, right? They're, they're flourishing and multiplying and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think there's some life that should be killed, right? Uh, and that's a case. Uh, mowing the grass would constitute something like genocide. Um, breathing would be morally questionable as you suck, suck in microorganisms. Um, when I use mouthwash, you know, I look at the label and it says kills germs on contact. That would be morally questionable, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know what we would eat if we really had a consistent pro-life view and thought that all living organisms deserved moral respect. Uh, eating green beans would be problematic. You know, you only get potatoes when you pull them out of the ground. And, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe you could wait underneath the apple tree, right, and have the apple fall, and the apple tree would continue to live. I, I don't know, but I mean, it just, uh, uh, cutting down shafts of wheat would be morally problematic. Um, but I'm not so sure what's problematic about cutting down shafts of wheat. <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, it's plants, for all we can tell, don't have central nervous systems and don't experience pleasure and pain, either at all or with any degree of intensity the way animals with central nervous systems do. Um, we can talk about this. I mean, some people do become remarkably sympathetic to plants when their cruelties to animals are brought to their attention, you know. But when I play Mozart to my geraniums, they grow better. You know, you've heard these sorts of arguments before. Uh, um, there's certainly a qualitative difference there. I mean, botanists explain growth in plants at the cellular level. There, there's, an, there's no central nervous system there, which enables us to understand how they could experience pleasure and pain, whereas we can understand how cows and pigs and lions and tigers and bears experience pain because they have central nervous systems. So I'm suggesting that rationality is too high a criterion for moral patiency status and that life is too low a criterion. The hurdle is so low that even, you know, asparagus are <laughs> getting over the hurdle and deserve moral respect. Uh, this is sort of like Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, soup is too hot or it's too cold. You want to get some calibrate your way to some sort of defensible posi position between the two extremes. What I'm claiming here is that the, the, what we ought to agree to is that the property that has to pos be possessed in order to be a moral patient is sentiency, right? The ability to experience pleasure and pain, okay? And, and, and I'm suggesting that if you think that through, it begins to look a, like a more and more defensible uh, sort of property that would have to be possessed to deserve moral respect. Okay. The, one of the advantages here is that sentiency is a low enough criterion that all human beings clear it. So infants are not rational, but they're sentient. Okay. People in the you know, advanced uh, Alzheimer's or senile dementia are sentient. Okay. Uh, and mentally challenged human beings are sentient. Like every once in a while you read in the paper, somebody who extinguishes lit cigarettes on the arms of a mentally challenged person, you know. I'm sure you read the paper, right? And you just, it's just horrendous things that people do. So, so even though that being is not rational, it strikes me that that's, you know, grossly immoral, right? Why? It hurts, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's enough. Sentience is 
uh, not only necessary, but sufficient I see, as I see things for being the possessor of rights and deserving moral respect. You don't need anything more than sentiency to deserve moral respect. Some people try to squeeze in between sentiency and rationality, potential for rationality. Notice that helps the infants, but it doesn't do much for people in senile dementia, right? Uh -huh. I mean, the potential for rationality still strikes me as too demanding a criterion for moral respect. And there's some beings who do not have the potential for rationality, who I still think, you know, deserve moral respect. Um, so just being able to experience pleasure and pain is enough as I see things. So um, uh, if you make the criterion for moral patiency status sentiency, you protect all human beings, okay? But the criterion would be relaxed enough that you would have to include animals with central nervous systems. But you see where I'm going with this. In other words, I don't see how there's any way you can develop a theory regarding moral patiency status where you can protect all human beings without also protecting animals with central nervous systems. In a way, the argument hinges on two really deceptively simple words, only and all. So only human beings can solve quadratic equations and do calculus, but not all human beings can do that. Like only we have a real, let's say that for the sake of argument. I don't know if that's true. If you look at some of the things the great apes can do and the whales and so on, maybe they're much more rational than we think. But let's say for the sake of argument, only human beings have advanced rationality. But not all of us do. Um, so if it's the case that we want to protect all human beings, we have to have some criterion of respect much, you know, less relaxed than rationality. Um, but then once you relax the standard to, to you know, to sentiency, then it looks like you're going to have to protect animals with central nervous systems as well. Um, so, uh, again, I think this has far-reaching uh, implications for what we eat, wear, experiment on. <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's very hard for us to imagine what the world would be like if people really did believe these two arguments, right? Um, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's like um, abolitionists trying to imagine what a world would be like without slavery, you know, before 1863, you know, or whenever the Emancipation Proclamation was, you know, delivered, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really quite a change. Uh, certainly in terms of the quantity of beings involved, you can push the analogy between racism and sexism on the one hand and then speciesism on the other. You know, they're just massive numbers of animals that are killed, right, for the table. Um, uh, so in terms of the quantity of beings involved, the analogy holds. I think in terms of the intensity of the pain involved, the analogy holds. So, so what we know about comparative physiology is that you know, when you select the carotid artery of a cow, the cow experiences the sort of pain that we would experience if our carotid artery was slit. You might want to say that the quality of lives of non-human animals is not on a par with the quality of our lives. Uh, that, that may be right. I mean, I mean, we have plans for the future and, you know, we have all sorts of sophisticated uh, rational pursuits and things that we worry about, you know, uh, that perhaps no animal, non-human animal would worry about. Um, but uh, I'd be willing to grant that for the sake of argument, that the quality of our lives is of a higher sort than the quality of typical non-human animal lives, but I don't know if that's enough to trump the quantity and intensity considerations, okay? Uh, you know, it's the number of animals uh, that experience unnecessary suffering and the intensity of their suffering um, is sufficient to, to have the analogy between speciesism on the one hand and then racism and sexism on the other be pretty strong as I see things. Um, so I'd like to make it clear that I'm making an argument here for animal rights and not animal welfare. The animal welfare is just somebody who um, would like some reform on factory farms, you know, the, you know, give chickens a little bit more room to move and <laughs> have fairer transport to the slaughterhouse. So the animal welfareist would think that slaughterhouses are okay as long as you kill the animals as painlessly as possible, okay? Um, so this is an animal rights view, which is a much stronger view, I think, than an animal welfareist view. So, so I'm all in favor of a lot of the things the animal welfareists want, you know, more room on factory farms uh, and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we get off the moral hook by uh, 
making sure that animals are killed as painlessly as possible, you know, like by bludgeoning them before we slit their carotid arteries. I don't know if you've been to slaughterhouses, but I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, the idea that if you sort of snuck up on them and kill them as painlessly as possible, then all the moral problems would be avoided. Um, actually, I do think that relatively painless killing of animals is better than when they're killed slowly and, you know, with intense pain. Uh, I, I, I'm not, so I think there's a lot of good that animal welfareists have, have done. Um, but still, um, all the future pleasures that the animals would have had are deprived, right? I mean, even if you killed them painlessly, you would still be taking away their lives. I mean, as I see things, it's the animal's life is its life and not mine. Uh, so even if you kill it painlessly, some serious wrong has been done. Um, so imagine two murders that I would commit. Suppose I killed one mur murdered one person in this room and I inflicted torturous pain on the being before I killed that being. And then the second person I murdered, I, I killed, but killed painlessly. I mean, the second killing is morally superior to the first, but <laughs> there's still something wrong about, <laughs> you know, taking the way a life of a being, you know, uh, that is its life and not, not mine. Um, um, so so I'm, I'm trying to make a distinction between an animal rights view on the one hand and then an, a weaker animal welfareist position on the other. Um, I suppose one other, I, I mentioned to Rich that uh, these arguments are philosophical arguments that are open to everybody. Uh, I also have a theological position uh, that I'm willing to talk about later on in the conver conversation period where um, I suspect one of the major forces at work against the animal rights position in our culture comes from uh, not, not only biblical fundamentalists, but, you know, uh, uh, Jews and Christians and Muslim believers who think that they have some sort of scriptural, you know, support for, you know, human dominion over animals. Um, and I see that as a much more complicated situation than most religious believers think it is. So we can maybe talk about that later. So I'm willing to stop here and uh, take questions and comments. Um, and again, I got thick skin if you have any criticisms. Yeah. Yeah. You covered a lot of territory there. Okay. Yeah. 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 See, these arguments here, the, the two arguments I have here are not. I'm not, I don't want to tie them to any particular religious tradition or, you know, so it's very, very complicated how yeah. attitudes toward, relig uh, toward animals uh, develop in various religious traditions here. You, you can see that this is, in a way, part of, for lack of a better word, like liberal political ideology, right? So I'm working on the assum assumption that the people who hear these two arguments think that there's something morally bothersome about racism and sexism, okay? And th uh, consider these two arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, and I think that I, I think there's some sort of something really, really important about thinking through really carefully. So, so, say the tradition you find in various religious traditions, but then also in secular traditions as well. The tradition of anthropocentrism, the belief that comes from the Greek word anthropos, which means human. The idea that human beings are the center of the world, and everything everything in the world is here to serve our interests. It's here for our benefit. These are two arguments that call into question the tradition of anthropocentrism, right? Okay, so you're us to philosophically yeah. more aware and therefore come to... Yeah, and I'm, I'm working on the assumption. Now, this may be an illegitimate assumption. I think I'm safe in this assumption that you see something morally bothersome about racism and sexism, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's the case that there's something bothersome about those phenomena and you ask what is, what is it that's bothersome about them, part of it is the arbitrariness, right? of making some people amenable to slave enslavement or some people, you know, not getting the vote because of their race or sex, right? Um, what I'm asking is, is it not the case that there's something arbitrary uh, about al allowing some, pe some beings to have gratuitous or unnecessary suffering or death inflicted on them, but not others on the basis of species? So the first premise to the argument from sentiency is suggesting that there's something wrong, like period, <laughs> uh, about inflicting suffering on a being that is unnecessary. And if some people want to have a cultural relative argument, but in my culture, you know, we've always... I know, you're not, I'm not, I know you weren't saying that, but I suppose somebody had a rejoinder like that, right, which is pretty common, then I'd say, well, you know, I know there, you can have the same sort of argument about racism and sexism, right? You know, some cultures have wanted to kill people in ethnic minorities, right? Or some cultures are misogynistic, right? Um, the fact that it's been around for centuries does not strike me as a strong argument for racism or sexism. The fact that human beings have been abusing animals for a long time does, 
in, does not strike me as a good argument for anthropocentrism or for inflicting unnecessary suffering on animals. Um, there's a lot else I want to say about all the religious traditions you mentioned. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of debates about, the, about where, to, where to draw the line there, okay? Um, Peter Singer is a famous uh, animal rightist, uh, or you have to have scare quotes, animal rightist in Singer's case because he's a utilitarian. But he thinks that the, the, the line should be drawn somewhere around mollusks or crustaceans. So uh, cows, pigs, and then also fish have central nervous systems or something like them such that they experience pain if you've ever seen a hook in a fish's mouth. And maybe not mollusks and crustaceans. For example, clams you know, have a cluster of ganglia that make them responsive to the environment in some way, but not exactly a central nervous system. However, um, there are a lot of people who are inciting more and more studies that would suggest that actually sentience might go down at least to the level of mollusks and crustaceans. So, but the fact that there are gray areas, right, um, does not, uh, it should not distract us from the obvious difference between an animal with a central nervous system on the one hand and then a plant on the other. It's certainly a, a huge difference in terms of level of sentience there, if it's the case that plants are sentient at all. So, yeah. Now, regarding the, you know, Thoreau has a chapter in Walden uh, called Higher Laws, where he switched from a meat-eating and fish-eating diet to a vegetarian diet. And then the reason why was he did his own butchering. Um, so some people could still stomach, you know, eating meat if they did their own butchering, you know. But he thinks that most people would not, you know, continue to eat meat if they actually butchered the animals and skinned them and all, all that themselves. Um, so it seems to me if you're honest, you should be willing to do, even if you don't do it, if you want to be a meat eater, you should be willing to at least see what's involved in the process. And like if you distance yourself from the violence involved, right, which typically people do, they go into Safeway and they buy meat, you know, wrapped in cellophane, it's very sanitized and, you know, um, people tend not to see the violence that's involved and don't want to see the violence involved, right? So, I don't, so I'm trying to respond to your question, you know, directly. I mean, it, it seems to me you don't get off the moral hook by having somebody else do it for you. Um, I find it interesting that beer drinkers like to go to breweries to see how beer is made. People who like cake love to go to bakeries. <laughs> I've never met a, somebody, uh, I, you know, I have brothers and, you know, relatives who just love hamburger, love meat, love steak. You know, the idea, let's, let, if you said, let's go to a slaughterhouse, they would never want to go. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know that, I mean, there is a way in which we distance ourselves from what goes on in this practice in ways that are different from the way we distance, you know, the way we react to, you know, bread that we eat or, you know, other things that we ingest, so... Regarding your second question is a, real, is a tough one about, you know, are there some human beings who do not even meet the sentience criterion, right? Like people in persistently vegetative states, do I understand you correctly? And, you know, um, and then the question is, you know, do they have lives worth living, right? Is, is, I mean, what, what are our moral responsibilities to beings who are maybe only marginally sentient, who are human beings, right? Um, um, it seems to me that if they're still living, there's still some sort of functioning central nervous system at work, right? Um, although it may be in a debilitated state, right? I mean, uh, not, all, not all, I mean, some human beings are in such a pitiful state that they not only are not functioning rationally, you're worried about they might not even function as sentient beings, and then the question is how do you protect them, right? Um, I suspect that they're still minimally sentient in some fashion or other, right? The fact that they're living at all as human beings. Um, yeah, there's also an honorific status they may have as human beings, right? Um, we, we remember them as once sentient beings if they're, you know, in, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, those are difficult cases in medical ethics. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that case. Yeah. My suspicion is that they would still be sentient in some fashion. So, uh, Some people point to the fact of predation. You know, if, if you think that predation is natural, is this what you're getting at? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So if, uh, you know, uh, say in the wild areas around here, if a coyote takes down a hare, you know, if that's natural, some people then try to say that it would be natural for a human being, you know, to engage in predation or meat-eating. Um, so if that's the... Uh, the question, um, 
Uh, I think we are moral agents, despite the fact that we may be driven by unconscious motives and <laughs> economic factors and so on. Um, it, it doesn't strike me that predators are moral agents. Like, I don't have the sense that a, a lion wakes up in the morning and asks, you know, what am I going to eat today? Am I, am I going to go Mexican, eat veggie, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 but we do. I mean, we have, you know, quite a number of different choices that we can make. And whatever choices we make regarding what we eat, I'm suggesting we have to morally justify. Um, so the fact that there's predation in nature, right, um, uh, is not necessarily a moral evil if the predators do what they do of necessity, right? Whereas I don't think we're natural predators. And in a way, this is perhaps related to this gentleman's question as well. Uh, I, I don't buy into the idea that human beings started out as predators. I mean, there, I'm not an anthropologist, but apparently there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the first human beings would have been nut and berry gatherers and root diggers. In other words, they would have eaten the way a lot of the great apes eat. You know, uh, they might have been op opportunistic meat eaters who would eat carrion flesh, right? Especially after a forest fire or something. But if they didn't have fire, you know what I mean? To right, yeah. I mean, this gets at a basic question. Are we moral agents? Or do we have to justify our behavior? Or, yeah. or do we act in such a way of necessity? Like we don't, we're, we're just instinctively driven or we're acting of necessity. We don't have to morally justify our behavior. Presumably, I mean, the coyote does not have to justify him or herself to me or to anybody else, right? When it kills and eats animals. Um, I think we do. So, in a way, there is a, a burden on the shoulders of beings who are moral agents, right? Um, that's the way I would put it, you know, that rationality has a cost, you know, then, then you've got to, what, justify your behavior. <laughs> you just can't say that you're doing it of necessity, so. Yeah, you covered a lot of ground there. I won't be able to respond to everything. Um, the thing about trees... Um, I mean, is it possible to lower the criterion for moral patiency status beneath sentiency? I mean, I talked a little bit about what would happen if we made it life rather than sentiency. Um, and it leads to just counterintuitive conclusions. Uh, you know, uh, so I, 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 for example, some people accuse the position I defend as not being anthropocentric, human-centered, but some people say it's sentient-centric, right? It's privileging sentient beings, okay? Well, fair enough. And then if you ask the question, well, why am I privileging sentient beings? It's another way of asking what's wrong with inflicting pain on a being unnecessarily. <coughs> and what I, my response would be to say, well, it hurts, and if it's unnecessary, right, there's something obviously wrong with that. It's like in math, you know, very often math proofs depend on certain assumptions, right, or, you know, uh, axioms you start with, and then those are conclusions to prior axioms. But then eventually you get to some simple things that you don't prove, you just see are true, like the law of identity, A equals A. Hardly anybody ever proves that, you know, you just <laughs> either see it or you don't. So in a way, my moral argument is backing up to an intuition that I'm suggesting we have that suggests what? Infliction of unnecessary pain is wrong, right? And I'm suggesting that Everybody understands that premise, right? That infliction of unnecessary pain is wrong. But most people haven't considered what follows from that, <laughs> okay? What I'm suggesting is if you start with that premise and then you throw in the second premise, right? An unconsidered conclusion follows. Um, Think about the deer, I, 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 this is similar to this person's question too. I have not tried to develop a whole environmental ethics here. You would have to deal with issues like predation what happens when hunters no longer hunt deer? The deer population may proliferate, and then that's going to have a negative effect on the vegetation around. I mean, there's, those are complicated problems, so I haven't tried to deal with those here. Um, however, I think the way to deal with the overpopulated, up, the overpopulation of deer is not to make hunting a sport. I mean, it'll be a sport when, you know, you've heard the joke, it'll be a sport when the deer get high-powered rifles, too. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I think that's funny, but anyhow. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it's a very complicated problem. No, there might be humane. There might be. There might be humane ways of regulating population of overpopulated species, right? 
um, you can, or population control methods other than violently killing the deer, okay? Um, actually, the problem backs up on what? If human beings kill off all or most of the natural predators, right, then the deer population explodes. And then the very people who killed off the natural predators volunteer to be the ones who are going to solve the problem of the overpopulated deer, and they're going to hunt the deer. Actually, let me just comment on the last part of your comments. You know, it takes apparently between about 15 and 20 pounds of grain fed to a cow in order to get one pound of beef. And also water and fertilizer and uh, oil to, you know, run the trucks to, you know, plow the ground to have all that. Yes, yeah. It's, it's like driving an SUV or something, you know, eating beef. It's, uh, so if, from a purely anthropocentric or human-centered point of view, if you wanted to make sure that all human beings were fed, it's much easier to do it on a vegetarian basis than on a meat-eating basis. Um, uh, now, I know some people have an argument that range-fed cattle would, you know, be grazing in areas that would not be used for any other purpose. But, you know, you have such a small number of cattle that can be supported by range-fed, you know, grazing techniques in the West. I mean, basically, in the United States, it's like huge. You can, you, if you've ever driven across the country, you know this. There's just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres, uh, millions of acres in the Midwest, right, that are grown for so corn and soybeans, right? And that is all fed to cows and pigs, and it's inefficiently, you know, results in food that we eat. But if we really were interested in making sure that all human beings had enough food, um, that's an argument against meat eating rather than an argument for meat eating. Um, now that's an argument from protein efficiency that is perfectly compatible with anthropocentrism, right? So a lot of people are anthropocentric or human-centered environmentalists. We should be concerned about destroying the Brazilian rainforest because of all the medicines that could help us that we won't get, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, so I'm suspicious of anthropocentric or human-centered arguments like that. Uh, this is an argument that, well, that is sentient-centric. Any being that can experience pain deserves moral consideration. That, that's what I'm claiming. Yeah. I mean, uh, Holmes Ralston is an environmental ethicist who has this phrase, super killing. So I'm talking about killing of individual beings. But if you killed all the members of a species, right, then that would not just be a killing, it would be a super killing. You know, you'd be killing not only every token, but you'd be killing the type. <laughs> um, uh, which, yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of examples of that, right? There'd be, I'm opposed to species extinction. I want to go on record. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's something bothersome about species extinction. However, species don't suffer. Members of species do if they have central nervous systems. Okay? So, some people, you know, it's, you know, like cowhood does not suffer. So some people who are concerned about species extinction are worried about snow leopard hood and maybe not individual snow leopards. You know what I mean? Or, they're concerned about pighood or cowhood, but not individual pigs. It's individual pigs and cows who suffer, not cowhood. Yeah. So, so I think you can over-concentrate on species, too. Um, um, the, the locus of suffering are individual beings. So in that, somebody, I forget somebody said that this argument is individualistic. I forget who said that. Uh, but in, in one sense, it is. I mean, it's, it's individuals who suffer, and then it's individuals who matter in that regard. That does not mean that I'm not interested in whole populations of human beings or deer or... Oh, yeah, you, that's a whole area you talked about I didn't talk about. Yeah, yeah I defend rights. I think it's in, they're important um, reminders of moral claims, okay? To say that somebody has a right to something means that they have a legitimate claim to something. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that without the notion of rights, then our moral deliberations would be decided in the aggregate, like, you know, that uh, we, we could sacrifice the interests of some if it's for the good of the whole. Um, and... Actually, I, I think the word for that is fascism, actually, <laughs> that you can fa sacrifice the interests of some and for, for, the, for the good of the whole. Um, Jefferson said that with every right, there's a responsibility. Yeah, that's problematic, isn't it? For example, I think, yeah, I, I don't think that's right. And I think you'll agree with me it's not right. Do you think that mentally challenged human beings only have rights if they're also rational enough to, to fulfill their responsibilities. Do you think that infants do not have rights because they're not yet responsible? No, I think you can have rights without being responsible. Infants, mentally challenged human beings have rights, I think. 
Sure, if he's talking in a political context, you know, people like us that, you know, somebody who constantly asserts their rights and doesn't fulfill their responsibilities, that's a problem. But I think there are beings in the world who are moral patients, but not moral agents. Um, and, and, I, and I shudder at the thought that we would not be willing to acknowledge their rights because they're not rational enough to fulfill their responsibilities. Um, this person had his hand up a long time ago, I'm sorry. I think there have, I don't think there are a huge number of examples of moral progress, okay? But I think there are some examples of moral progress. Uh, I think the abolition of slavery was an example of moral progress and increasing attentiveness to the issues of race, right, are examples of moral progress. Um, treating women as equals, right, to men is an example of moral progress. We're living through a period in which there's, you know, some evidence, right, um, that the evils of racism and sexism, right, are being ameliorated, not as quickly as we would like them to be eliminated, right? Um, I'm not saying that the battle is over and so on and so forth, but um, the idea that, you know, we're no better off having abolished slavery than we were when we owned slaves. Um, Actually, my relatives were in Poland. They didn't own the slaves. But anyhow, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, abolishing slavery and enfranchising women are not examples of moral progress, I, I find really counterintuitive. Um, and what I'm asking here is, uh, is there room for moral progress, not only with respect to questions regarding race and sex, but then also regarding species, okay? I'm not... I, my, I hope I'm not Pollyannish here. I, I realize that this is still a minority position, right? But there are many, many more people who are vegetarian in Western culture than were vegetarian a few generations ago, right? Um, does, it strikes me as not being not outside the realm of possibility that speciesism will generally be seen as a moral evil, right? If not in my lifetime, over... You need a wide-angle lens here, right? Um, I mean, the battle against slavery took, I mean, you could say that, you know, the writings of St. Paul, right, were a protest against slavery in some ways, and then took a long time, took 2,000 years until Christians finally, <laughs> you know, uh, got rid of slavery. Um, I hope it's not that long with respect to speciesism, but, you know, um, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility there could be marked moral improvement of human, being, human beings' behavior with respect to animals over the course of time. Thoreau was viewed as a nut in the 19th century because of a chapter, you know, in, in Walden that, you know, talked about higher laws with respect to treatment of animals. And now, I mean, pretty normal, right, to, to think of the sort of things that Thoreau was thinking about and defend them in public. So I don't know if I've responded to everything you were getting at, but uh, uh, you know, if what you're, if, if what the claim is is that you know human beings have done terrible things, right? And there's always the possibility that we will revert back to selfish behavior that is either anthropocentric or racist or sexist. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've read history. Yeah, human beings have done terrible things, and it's always possible that we'll end up doing terrible things again. But. Um, um, yeah, I, th I think even the best thinkers in previous ages, um, and this is one of the distressing things about reading some of the founders of the United States, is that you know even the best thinkers, you know, brighter than we are, like Jefferson, was you know a brilliant guy who just basically defended things that we think today are indefensible. Um, um, so I do think it's possible to have moral progress. Yeah. I don't want to overstate the case, though. I'm not trying to say it's going to happen automatically, and I'm not trying to say there's no very difficult theoretical issues and practical issues that have to be resolved. Um, but Well, this argument from sentiency here, it does start from an intuition, and the intuition is that it's wrong to inflict suffering unnecessarily, right? I mean, uh, I mean it's, it's that simple. Now, I don't end with the intuition, though. I try to develop an argument from that, right? But, but that's the basis of it, is that intuition that people have, right? And even people who don't accept the argument overall <laughs> see that there's some force, you know, behind that intuition. Yeah. yeah. Well, the fact that you could inflict suffering on others, there's all kinds of beings I could inflict suffering on. That doesn't mean that I would, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Why would you? And when I ask about what the morality. Yeah, yeah, see what you're getting at. Yeah. You know, for me, it always does come back to obedience as a man. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
let me let me respond to the, the in this way. Uh, this gets at the sort of a theological argument I had that I, th- I thought because I was going to come to a church, there were going to be people who were going to ask me about the theological implications of all this. But um, so the standard, you know, like standard Jewish and Christian, and in a different way Muslim, you know, view is what that um, human beings are given dominion over the rest of creation by God, right? Because they're made in. God's image. So when you find that in Judaism and Christianity and Genesis. And then you get it in a different way in Islam, but they don't like the images thing. But, you know, you still have this anthropocentric view that human beings are special and get driven privileges with respect to nature by God. Okay? I mean, I take it that's the standard account that believing Jews and Christians and Muslim believers would hold, right? Uh, I find the biblical case much more complicated. Um, for example, let me mention five or six things. So, so if you did have a morality that had to be rooted in ancient wisdom, okay, um, and a sense of command. I find it interesting that the Garden of Eden was to, be, was to have been a vegetarian paradise. Okay, you actually go back and read what, what was the story in Genesis. Uh, it was a vegetarian paradise, and it's not until after the fall, and actually the, after Noah, right, that they're then given, in scare quotes, permission to eat animals. But uh, the way I read it, it's not that Yahweh says it's okay to eat animals, it's more like if you guys are going to be sleazy, at least you should, you know, have a ritualized slaughter where animals experience as little suffering as possible. It's not so much that this is something good, but a concession to human sinfulness. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, you find various authors complaining about the stench of animal sacrifice. So in those times, there was not like a, a, a temple or a religious building here and then a slaughterhouse over there, right? The slaughtering of animals happened right at the temple. So Isaiah and Hosea and a lot of those, you know, Hebrew prophets really complain about animal sacrifice. It was never something that rested easy with the, 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 many of the prophets. Um, uh, Jesus talks about, you know, God caring even for the fall of a sparrow. Um, you know, it might have been the case that Jesus himself was a countercultural Jew. Uh, who resisted animal sacrifice. You have that whole story of what happened at the temple where Jesus expels all the animals from the temple. And Christians have noticed every part of that story except the part where Jesus expels the animals from the temple. <laughs> okay. um, and at the Last Supper, which was what? The Passover feast. I always wonder when I read that story about the Passover feast and the Last Supper, where's the lamb? It's the most amazing thing that hardly anybody notices. The, 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 the menu... If when I look at the menu, it's, you know, bread and wine. There's no lamb there. I mean, one way you can you, you interpret that is to say Jesus was a countercultural Jew who was, you know, opposed to ritualized slaughter of animals and um, had a much more humane view than most Christians have, you know, read into Scripture. Uh, I don't stand behind everything I just said, but I think that it's a much more complicated story than most Jews, Christians, and Muslim, you know, believers tend to think it is. Um, so in other words, I think that people in contemporary religious institutions have done very poorly by their own traditions. It's, it, they're much richer traditions than people are willing to, to, to admit. But I, I think that does not answer this person's question. His, his question was not, is it possible that you would have non-religious believers be good people? That's obvious. You could have non-religious believers be very, very good people. You are, uh, yeah, right. That's an easy one. I take it your question was a harder one. How do you justify moral principles if there's not an omnibenevolent, omniscient being who is issuing the command, right? Um, okay, I mean, it, it's different. So you can empirically notice a lot of people who are not religious believers who are really decent, admirable people, but you're asking the question, how do you justify morality if it's not on the basis of some sort of source of the morality that is omnibenevolent and omniscient? The Kantian response to that is to say that human powers of rationality. Now, the, you know, now you have to, we have to correct each other's mistakes. You know, it's a communal effort. But human powers of rationality are such that human beings can issue moral commands to themselves. Okay. I, I just wanted to thank you about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.